Welcome, everybody, to the Cross Ice Feed Podcast. I'm David Stearns. Joined with me, as always, is Brian Schrems. Schrems, what do we have on the docket this week? We're talking playoff hockey, and we're talking a little bit about this outdoor game, or games, if you will, coming up next season. But I, I say we start with the race to the finish here, and, and both divisions are just just... A lot of fun to watch. It's shortened season and all disappointing, but there's certainly no lack of entertainment in the standings right now, I'll tell you that much. Um, let's start. I'm going to start out west. Okay. And I, and I want to make mention of a team that that deserves all the credit in the world. And, and if I'm not mistaken, and I, I want to say um, back in August when you and I sat down, the Columbus Blue Jackets were going off at – Thousand to one? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. Maybe fifteen hundred to one to win the Stanley Cup this year. Yeah. And if anything uh, from last year, if, if we learned anything from the Los Angeles Kings, if you get hot at the right time and you have a goalie it's playing out of his mind, then uh, you know you you got a legitimate shot to make a splash here. And, and I like Columbus and, and what they've done at the end of the season. I don't know if they're going to make a push to the Stanley Cup, but honestly, have they not been fun to watch? Well, they have been fun to watch, and, you know, I'm, I'm impressed. Uh, Vinny Prospel is leading the way for them, and then between the pipes, picking up Sergei Bobrovsky from the Philadelphia Flyers in their trade with Mason. That I is, saw that coming. Yeah, that, that, that caught me out of left field. And then adding, of course, Marion Gabrick to the mix, uh, you got yourself a powerhouse up front and between the pipes now. And then you got some ga- great contributions from other players down the entire roster. Even Fetter Tootin. I never thought I'd still be saying his name, but Fetter Tootin is a production defenseman for this team. I mean, he's a playmaker, and I, I like what I see out of him. Staying in the positives on the plus-minus, that's always good for a defenseman. And he's logging 23 minutes a night on the average, so... Still impressive for Fetter Tutin. I'm I'm liking where this team's going, and uh, you know also some of the other players that have joined the fray there. Well, Fetter Tutin, uh, granted he's in his late 90s, but you know I thought he would have trailed off and just disappeared. Uh, but you know talking about the additions of like uh, Latestu, uh, we we saw him with Pittsburgh, and then you know just some other random deals that took place to get this roster just gelled together, and you know. I got to give uh, you know all the credit in the world there for Columbus firing their general manager, getting rid of, getting rid of um, uh, Housen, and and then also bringing in uh, John Davidson from St. Louis to be a front office advisor in in managing and in, in trying to improve this organization like he did with St. Louis. We remember where St. Louis was after their kind of their heyday back in the late '90s, and they just kind of trailed off for a bit. John Davidson right. ca- came in, owned the team, and really turned that franchise around. He's doing just that with Columbus now. I was going to say, it, it really surprised me when Davidson left. Probably one of the more likable players in terms of management in the entire league. He took the the whole Blues organization and, and just did some wild stuff with it. I remember a couple of years back where they were offering to pay the yep. mortgage. Yep, that's exactly of, of what fans. came to mind. Yep. Come to the game, we'll pay your mortgage for you. <laughs> Um, you won't be disappointed, and, and honestly, they haven't disappointed. That team, with with as little money as they're spending, has put together just a a, a ridiculous amount of of talent that has yet to, you know, grow into its own. Yeah. And you have players like Perrin and Bacchus, who's a nice leader. You have Oshi, who's still out there. You got stud defenders and. You know, tandem goaltenders here and there. Elliot needs to play a little bit better. Mm-hmm. Halak is is dealing with some injuries and, and so forth. But nonetheless, they pick up a, a nice goaltender in the off season. Maybe um, maybe you see a cup in the near future. Yeah, I'm kind of still surprised from last year when they gave away Ben Bishop. But uh, you know, regardless, they're doing fine. Columbus and St. Louis right now. Uh, they're one point apart at seven and eight in the West. My only question is, can these two teams hold on with Detroit? You know, they, they're really hitting rock bottom at this point in the season. Detroit's behind Columbus 
two points back at 47 in ninth place. And then Dallas, of course, trailed off. We talked with A.J. Henty last week, our resident Dallas Stars expert, talking that, you know, there could be a chance, but he wouldn't, he, he kind of wouldn't want it to happen, uh, that his team would make it in. But uh, does St. Louis and Columbus end up sealing out the Western Conference going into the playoffs, just sealing up the, the final eight? It's been 21 seasons since the Detroit Red Wings have missed the Stanley Cup playoffs. Yeah. And I remember talking to a, a Red Wings fan a couple of years ago, and I'm, I'm watching these games on TV, and I said, listen, do your fans get excited ever? And he, he, he said jokingly, he said, not really during the regular season. Um <laughs> it's it's the regular season is more of a formality. We're more of a playoff team, and that doesn't seem to be the case this year. And it, it makes you wonder: is 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 Nick Lidstrom what's keeping this team um, afloat all these years? Is, is was that the was that the, the the focal point of that team for the past twelve, fifteen seasons? Well, you also got to think too. Uh, was it Tomas Holmstrom too in the mix there too? Uh, it's it's a bunch of things. And then they got rid of Yuri Hoodler, and you know the team. It's reverting back to a younger team. You know the joke was always that the average age of the Detroit Red Wings goes up every year. Well, of course it does because they keep the same guys and they continually get older. And so, like the average age of the team was like in the 30s. So that's usually not good for your organization. A good average age for your team should be somewhere in the mid twenties to low twenties. If you want, well, I mean, you know, with a couple of veterans sprinkled in there, Detroit, they're out of veteran leadership. I mean, Zetterberg's still there, and you know, of course, Pavel Datsuk, but those two guys can't do it on their, you know, on their own. Johan Franzen, you know, the mule, he can come through in the playoffs in the clutch, but uh, I don't see, I don't see where this roster is. Uh, is showing what Detroit is usually made of when it comes down to do-or-die circumstances. Yeah, I was surprised to see there wasn't more defensive help going towards Detroit at the trade deadline. Yeah. They could they could certainly use some sort of, of veteran presence. Cronwall, yeah. yeah. Kendall, Maybe. Kendall. Yeah. Uh, Ian White, not so much. No. I like Rafalski. I mean, but, but he was yeah. he's, he's gone now, and it's it, there may be there may be some minor rebuilding. You can rebuild around well, Jimmy Howard. Um, well, yeah, they I mean, he just him got himself six, extension. Yeah, he got himself an extension. Six years, they good. got some time. <laughs> no, they do, and and you still have that who can Zetterberg. That's it's not a bad thing, but you you have to. You have to dig into your system a little bit as to where, like you were saying, those players, those, those those veteran players who never left, you never had to worry about digging into your system because they were there. Right. Now you have to test what your system is made of, what you've been drafting for, and, and hopefully they have another Datsuk in the wings here. I, I've seen a lot of praise come out lately, not necessarily for an offensive player, um, but um, Applicator is, is getting a lot of praise for his, his work ethic and you know, he's he's getting the time that he deserves on the ice, but it, it's it's not going to be an advocator that gets you back in the Stanley Cup Finals. You need to have two solid, yeah, first lines or, or two solid lines up front, one and two, and then a, a grinder line and, and your your tough guys. And that defense has got to get short up. I, I say they miss the playoffs. I, I'm I'm going to go out on the limb and say that Columbus maintains their they're red hot right now. They're riding a hot goaltender. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go with Columbus and St. Louis both making it and Detroit on the outs. Yeah, being that it's going to be a 48-game season because of the uh, the shortened season with the lockout, it looks as though the Detroit Red Wings are setting themselves up to not even have a 20-goal scorer at this rate when the season closes out in 48. So they got a lot of work cut out for them, and um, yeah, it was just a hand a handful of games remaining. They really have to switch it in the high gear, being only three, five, and two in their last ten games, and it's it, yeah, they're just anemic as far here, as goal scoring. And here, here's, yeah. the, here's the thing with Detroit, though, it's not a tough sell to bring quality players to Detroit. Bringing quality players to Columbus, yeah, yeah. it's a little bit more yeah. difficult. 
you, you have a legacy in Detroit. You know that team can be a whole lot better than what they're showing at this point in time. They'll yeah. they'll be just fine next year, but maybe the shortened season kind of burned them here. Yeah, and they lost to Calgary last night for crying out loud. So that hey. speaks volumes there. Hey. So, but uh, yeah, so Detroit, yeah, probably not going to catch anyone there. So maybe St. Louis and Columbus are safe. And uh, you know Dallas is turning it on at the right time too, but it might be a little too late for them. Although they do kind of have a few games at hand on the competition ahead of them, but uh, w- with that being said, uh, do you think Dallas leapfrogs Detroit and possibly Columbus or St. Louis to make their way into it? Uh, looking down the stretch, they they got some tough matchups: Vancouver, St. Louis, Los Angeles, San Jose, Columbus, and finishing out Detroit. Yeah. It's, it's, that's not the most favorable. You'd like to see more bottom matchups than top, and it, it just isn't going to happen. Um, Tall order. Yeah, yeah it, it is, but uh, I'm not thinking so for Dallas. So, a disappointing disappointing season, to say the least. And I'll, I'll jump divisions and I'll jump teams to another yeah. disappointing team from the East. Um, let's talk about New Jersey. Okay. You, you, go, you go from an extreme high last season to an extreme low. I personally was not on board with New Jersey last year. I wasn't a believer, I, you know, despite yeah. making it to the cup and everything. Th- there was just something about them that, that, I don't know, I don't know. We, we we couldn't quite put our fingers on it last year. What what did New Jersey have that everybody else didn't have? And what, what put them above a team like Pittsburgh or, or, or what have you? Yeah, well, I can't say. Yeah. They're scrambling right now. Let me real quickly about the uh, the Western Conference. Uh, yeah. I, do you think the eight that we see now is the eight that we're going to get? Yeah, they, they may toggle positions. Okay. Um, Vancouver, Los Angeles, San Jose might toggle, but um, I'm, I'm thinking that's what you're going to get. Okay, good. All right, now back to New Jersey as you bring them up. Yeah, the the issue with them right now. Uh, the way I see it is uh, defensively, and I'm going to go no secondary scoring. Uh, I mean, yeah. you got some depth players on your roster, but the thing is something's not clicking. They didn't change much as far as their roster from last year. And the, one of the other things that you might want to point towards is your goaltending. I mean, the goaltending is putting up some good numbers, but you have two aging goaltenders. Uh, sitting up there at the front. I mean, Marty Brodeur is unquestionably at the end of his career. He is 40 years old. And then you take a look at Johan Hedberg, and I believe he's in his late 30s. And if I remember correctly, I think he's 38. So, uh, 39, I beg your pardon. So you got two very, uh, at the end of their career, goaltenders. And you got these two other guys in your in your, in your your system, uh, Jeff Fraze and Keith Kincaid. I don't know if those two goaltenders are going to be the future of the New Jersey Devils, but let's see if they want to roll with them because, granted, we've seen Marty Berger go out and, you know, Johan Hedberg go out with injuries here. Um, and I, I don't think that they're solid on their defensive core or goaltending. And then, like I said, secondary scoring. So it's a combination of things. But like I said, their roster didn't change much from last year. And, Maybe just the stars aligned last year for them. It, it's it's quite possible, and 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 certainly they're missing Kovalchuk down this stretch here. He he plays a huge factor in, into their their scoring. As you said, top line scoring is 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 not a problem, mm-hmm. but going beyond that, I I can't really say. Yeah. I, I can I can pinpoint a a 15 goal score let alone a 20-goal scorer. Kovalchuk, obviously, is going to be your elite player that you want to build your franchise around. However, players like Travis Zajac has, has been more than a disappointment in this shortened season. Oh, yeah. He was expected to pick up and, and kind of be that one-two punch with Kovalchuk, and it, it just hasn't happened. And, and the extension that he signed and the money that they're paying him, they, they certainly expected a lot more than, than what they got from him so far this season. Yeah, and then Steve Sullivan's another player that stands out to me. It's like, hey, where does he fit anymore, and why is he why is he still an active player? Like, with the hey, hey don't knock Steve Sullivan. Man. I'm sorry. He, he's a good rental. He he is your Jason Arnott for the next three or four years. <laughs> well, he's in his late 30s, almost 40. So, yeah, <laughs> you're gonna start seeing names turn out, you know, out of the league, and you're gonna see a bunch of new names that you're gonna be like. What what happened to the old guard here that we were used to seeing for the last ten fifteen years? You know, it's it, it's 
true. The the players that we've come to know over the years are are making their exit, and and you know I I always do it every single year. Who 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 is going to be the the next generation of I guess rental players? Yeah. And and certainly C Sullivan is up there now. Um, but honestly, you can't write these old guys off just yet. Look look at how well Yager's doing. Yeah. I mean, he, he he's he's an incredible athlete. He's still got tremendous skill and a lot to offer. Anybody who's willing to pay him a little bit more for you know fifteen or twenty games. Yeah. Well, it's 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 going to be sticky. For, you know, it's like where where's Chris Chelios when you need him? Right? Come on. He he's uh, the last time I checked, he was more fit than about half of the players in the NHL <laughs> at age fifty-four. Oh man. Yeah. Well. He was up there, and uh, I don't. Do it. I don't know if he beat uh, Gordy Howe's record in age and playing uh, in an active uh, in an active role in professional hockey. But uh, all right, let's move on here. We're about 15 minutes deep into this uh, shindig, and let's talk about uh, some surprises that are good surprises, like the positive surprises. I'm gonna I'm gonna start this one out here, and I'm gonna go with the Washington Capitals. If you if you ever thought that this team was gonna make the playoffs after the way they started this season. People would have thought you were nuts. Uh, right now, they are in a sweet position unless Winnipeg turns it on and potentially bumps them down towards the bottom, maybe 7 or 8 position, or out. Uh, this is going to be a wacky finish, but I don't think Washington's going to have any trouble getting into the playoffs the way they've been playing lately. And Alex Ovechkin suddenly came out of nowhere. It, it took a while to get acclimated to the new coaching situation, and certainly... It's 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 not something you would expect to be um, soaked up right away. Mm-hmm. You, you have um, Adam Oates, who is certainly no stranger to the game, but maybe a little bit more of a novice when it comes to coaching. And it was it was very evident early on. And you and I lived down here. We we saw it that there, there was just no fluidity to that game. Yeah. And then all of a sudden. It, it, it picks up, and at that point, you're turning to, you're turning to grade eight to, to, to do what he's supposed to do, making the money that he's making, and honing the talent that he has. It was it was his job to get that team out of the gutter, and you and I and and anybody that we talk to always had that that Russian figure in the back of our head. Is this player going to defect back to the KHL because yeah. things aren't going their way? And uh, I'm, I'm kind of glad he, he saved face here and, and kept it together. And, yeah. you know, this is why they pay him what they do. And the guy's on an absolute tear. He's the best player in the league right now. Yeah, he's uh, he actually did state that, you know, this past lockout would be something that could scare players off in staying with the KHL. But uh, fortunately for him, it took him about 15 games to get it started. Now he is leading the league in all sorts of categories. I mean, the guy's got 15 power play goals by himself. Uh, with you know the, the 28 goals that he's scored, 15 of them are on the power play. Talk about a, a powerful force. Uh, I mean, they're not the number one in the league with the power play, but still, uh, if you ever get a, a penalty against the Washington Capitals, you you better bet that Ovechkin's going to score on you. But, you know, I, I, I'm starting to like where things are going with them because, you know, at the beginning of the season, the way it progressed, Mike Ribeiro was their best player, and then from there on out throughout the roster, it was hit and miss with a bunch of guys. And then, yep. you know, it's just – it was a very disappointing and a very slow start, and I, I started to see people fall off the wagon around here in the D.C. area. But now people are back on board and, you know – uh, Brooks like I believe is back to is he is he completely healthy now? No, uh, last time I checked, he was back out with a groin injury. Uh. They're, they're not disclosing much about him. Yeah. Um, See and, now that, and, you know yeah. he may have he may have been one of those players that that everybody jumped on board with the one year that he had what fifty or sixty points. Yeah. And hasn't even come close to achieving that since. Mm-hmm. Um, but. They're they're not missing him tremendously because I believe a man named Marcus Johansson has stepped up. Oh yeah, and is playing exceptionally well this season, much better than most people anticipated. 
So he's he's a nice filler for what like could have potentially brought. I don't necessarily think that he was going to mm-hmm. post his numbers like we had hoped that he would have like a couple of years ago. But um, you know, I like that they brought in Iran. Iran's been suffering at the <laughs> hands of Barry Trotz and that offensiveless team in Nashville for the past. Oh my goodness! Career. He's yeah. been their career, hasn't he's, he? He's he's their career player. They didn't they didn't franchise him by any stretch, though. Though they did give him the, the option for the no movement clause, and well, he was more than happy to waive that to make his way to Washington. But uh, you know, it, it, when you look at the center position with Washington, they're set. You know, they got four solid centers all the way down to the four four lines that they ro- that they roll with, and then when you look at the right wing position, Troy. Brower, man, that guy is a beast. I'm going to yep. give him all the credit in the world. They're second in scoring as far as uh, for the team uh, for goals. But, I mean, you, you look at your top three, as expected, Ovechkin, Backstrom, and then Mike Ribeiro there. And then from there on out, it's pretty much the right wing position following up there. And they're playmakers. They're not goal scorers on the right wing, ex- with the exception of Troy Brower. But uh, that right wing position, uh they're making it happen, and I think they're kind of the unsung heroes here uh, that are pretty much helping feed the superstars ahead of them on their roster. Which, and which is fine. You know, it's it's one thing to be wanting the the, the credit and, and trying to, to step into this spotlight. Unfortunately for everybody else in Washington, the spotlight will never be on them. It's mm-hmm. going to be on Backstrom. It's going to be on Ovechkin. But I don't. I don't think it bothers them, bothers them all that much. I, I, I think there's they're a good cohesive unit, and not for nothing, you're going to add Kinetsov next year. Yeah. And that that Ovechkin, Backstrom, and Kinetsov is it's just going to be one of the most ridiculous lines in the league. We got to come up with a clever uh, nickname for that line before people start throwing them out there. We'll talk. Uh, we'll talk on the side. If anyone exactly. wants to suggest a name for the Knetsov, Ovechkin, and Backstrom line, send us your suggestions. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, real, real quick to round things out on Washington, though, can Braden Holtby repeat what he did last year? I I don't see why he couldn't. And what I like about Holtby is not necessarily his gameplay but what's playing in front of him. There are no big names on that defense. And and I say that fully aware that Mike Green is back there. I'm I'm not I'm not sold on Mike Green. They they need to sell him if if he's healthy heading into the off season and they do well in the playoffs, you gotta sell that guy as fast as you can. Yeah, he's hot and cold. Too um, hot and cold. Yeah. Well and, and the injury proneness is, is really getting to him for what they're paying him. But I, I like how there are no flashy players on defense. Carlson, yes, is going to be a great power play quarterback, but you are getting quiet contributions. Um, uh, oh my goodness, Hillen is yep. is playing very well. Plus, he's a smart defender. Um, what is it, Oleski? Yes, Alec- Oleski. Oleksi. Yeah, he's he's the yeah. up and coming defenseman for them. I like him. Nice play, yeah. nice player as well. Nothing flashy. Gritty. Mm-hmm. I like how he plays the game. They have Dmitry Orlov yep. in the AHL, toggling back and forth between NHL and AHL. Yeah, he saw a lot more time last year. Yeah. Yeah. No, he did, and and he's he's going to be a good one too. But their defense. Well, you're is forgetting John Carlson, by the way. And, oh, Carlson's going to be a good power play quarterback. Oh yeah. Um, it's 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 not flashy, but it gets the job done. You okay. don't need. Six big name defenders. I, I like the quiet guys that shut up and do their job, and and to, to play the uh, to play the Buffalo card for the first time this evening. Yeah. Um, Alexander Solzer. I, I really like the way he plays his game. Nothing, nothing crazy. Very smart player. Mm-hmm. Um, will quietly contribute 20, 25 points a season, which mm-hmm. is which is fine. But you're, you're not going to see him in the minus too often. Right. So a good supporting cast in front of Holtby, you think it could be a possibility that he'll he'll be hot like he was last playoffs? As of right now, they open with the Islanders. I, how can you be sold on the Islanders? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
Well, they did beat Toronto tonight, which was kind of a big selling point for them. And they could potentially leapfrog them into the fifth seed. So Could you, could you imagine? I mean, I mean, look at all the – if we're talking surprises, let's talk about the Islanders. Let's talk about the Maple Leafs. Uh, yeah. Please. And Montreal. Montreal, Montreal last year there. they were in the basement of the East, and all of a sudden, I mean, give Michelle Therrien a hand, you know, doing a fine job up there. <laughs> God, God forbid Buffalo makes the playoffs, and and they have to face Pittsburgh in the first round. <laughs> but but they, that would they make... proved they can handle them last week when, or two weeks ago when Jerome McGinley's first game in Pittsburgh they defeated them four yeah. to one. I, you know what? I'm 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 not going to write them off until they're mathematically out. But if they do make the playoffs, that is all five northeastern teams in the playoffs this season. Yeah, that'd be obscene. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, it, it it might come down to possibly bumping out Ottawa for Buffalo to make it in there, but because the Rangers are turning it on here, uh, of course there are winners tonight over Florida, which is kind of no big whoop, but it does make a difference in the standings. Let's talk about that dogfight at the bottom here. Uh, last night, of course, uh, Boston and Buffalo, uh, first sporting event after the uh, the tragic events up there at the Boston Marathon. Uh, our thoughts with everybody that is affected by that event and uh, it was uh, an emotional game, and it came down to 24 seconds, and Vanek setting it up for the tip for Cody Hodgson, past Kadobin, sending this game to overtime and eventually the shootout. What a surprise that one was because Drew Stafford getting uh, the winner in the third round. Talk a little bit I... about what you saw from that Buffalo team and whether or not they can carry it forth in their final four games to push for the playoffs, if it's possible. If, if, if you're going to make a comparison to another team, I, I would say the 99 team best represents what we see here now. <laughs> the nobodies? In terms of no names. Yeah. You you have a bunch of kids out there, essentially. The the entire roster from the, from the Rochester Americans. The, let's say this. The top two lines from the Rochester Americans – are now playing two and three for the <laughs> Buffalo Sabres. It's it, it, it's a unique strategy, though, because you take the coach from Rochester and you start filtering up players that have been with him all season. And, and Rolston knows these guys. He's he's a respectable coach. I'm not going to take anything away from him. Um, but my my thing with 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 last night. Yes, I was very happy with it. Um, Miller's finally getting the production he needs and, and the defense that he needs in order to, to snag a win here or there. I know mm-hmm. he felt frustrated for a while, but, you know, it was it was interesting to see Boston in this shootout. It was... They were taking the puck wide, and... It was it was sloppy. It was. And, and, I, and I was you know, surprised. I understand, I understand given the circumstances, you have a lot more on your mind than, than, than a hockey game, but... Um, you know, it's it's it was a surprise to see how sloppy they were in the shootout. It was surprised not to see uh, surprised not to see Rask in that. Yeah. Um, I know you want to preserve him for the playoffs. I, I get that, and Kudobin's not a bad backup. But I don't know. I'm I'm, I'm hoping that personally, I'm hoping that Buffalo does and doesn't get that treatment going down the stretch. Okay. Um, I would like to see them in the playoffs. It's good for the city. But they step into that eight seed, and they, they have a very tall order in front of them, and they will not get past Pittsburgh, I, I guarantee you. One game they cannot last them, but not in the series. Yeah, they, last year's last-ditch effort and the, uh, the hope that we all had that they could possibly squeeze into the eighth seed or seventh seed, uh, very, very disappointing finish uh, then. They got hot at the right time, just off by a couple of games, though, because they didn't really turn it on until about February last year, being which, that it was which, a full season. I mean, how how many times do do we have to see this? Yeah, the, the team just flatlines in the middle of the season, and then all of a sudden in February they decide to play, and they're scorching hot until the the last game where they miss the playoff by two points. Yeah. Well, I don't know if 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 you want if you want. My honest opinion: I wouldn't want to see that team in the playoffs. I would. I would rather see Winnipeg. 
Yeah. I, I, want, I want playoff hockey back in the peg. Okay. I, I, I heard that they're going for the whiteout if it happens. Yeah, that's... And that's... <laughs> there is no better place to play hockey in this league than in Winnipeg. Winnipeg. Yeah. Um, and that is true uh, home ice advantage right there. That's, there. that's something you can't find anywhere else in the league. There still is a chance that Ottawa or the Rangers can fall out, but the Rangers, uh, they found they found it. Uh, but uh, losing to Philly the other day did not help their cause. <laughs> the Rangers have found it, and apparently it was hiding in Columbus all along. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I'm I'm thinking about Columbus for a, a potential uh, place to live one day. So, people of Columbus, prepare yourselves. But uh, no, just just looking at the way things are set up here in the final stretch, the teams that are just knocking at the door right now: Winnipeg and Buffalo. No chance for Philly. Philly's too deep back with 41 points. But right now, the way it stands, the Rangers have 48 points in eighth place. Winnipeg back by two and uh, Buffalo back by four. But as I see it here as the games are concluding tonight, the Rangers will go ahead by six, which puts them tied with Ottawa. And um, no, no, that's already inclusive of tonight's win over Florida. I beg your pardon. So they are at 48 points in eighth place. Winnipeg, uh, if they hold on tonight and win, which uh, they are up three to two as we are speaking, assuming that they do win, That'll put them up ahead of Buffalo by four points. So it's kind of one of those, it's a little bit out of reach kind of situations. But the Rangers will have one game at hand on Buffalo. Winnipeg and Buffalo will be tied, or they'll be essentially even on games. So, but looking at Buffalo's remaining schedule, it is the teams in front of them, the New York Rangers, and then the oddball Pittsburgh Penguins, then Winnipeg, and then the Islanders. And so... I, they proved they could do it against Pittsburgh, so I'm not as worried about that game as I am about the Winnipeg game, believe it or not. When Winnipeg, even even when they were in Atlanta, they had Buffalo's number. Oh, there, yeah. there, was some, there was something about it. There was something in the water. You can't, you, you can't be a Sabres fan and look for a game against Winnipeg and think favorably of it. Because there's something about that matchup that Winnipeg just commands, mm-hmm. and if 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 one of those teams has to make, I don't want to see the Rangers in. Yeah, I I, I want to see Winnipeg, and and so do so does Canada, and and the fact that you could have that much representation in the Stanley Cup playoffs from Canada, it's been a long time. Well, Alberta is not going to be happy about it at all. No, no, but... we'll, we'll just we'll just <laughs> we'll sweep Alberta under the rug for now. But having Vancouver, potentially Ottawa, potentially Winnipeg, and Montreal, yeah, it's 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 one of those teams that can that could poise themselves for a deep run to make it a a, a Canadian Cup year. Yeah, and of course Ottawa beat Washington tonight three to one, and. Uh, you know, that's kind of a huge deal for Ottawa to kind of shore up uh, their bid for a postseason spot. But the Islanders beating Toronto, that was kind of a surprise. And we talked that, you know, a team that really surprised us is probably the Islanders being where they are in the mix. And, uh, you know, we thought that the Islanders would have been switched places there with the New Jersey Devils uh, being in the 12th seed. But... What happened here? What 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 is the what is the New York Islanders doing that other teams aren't doing here? Because it they just came out of nowhere. What do they have? Is it Nabokov? Is it Tavares? What is it? T- Tavares is not going to get a lot of love when, when it comes to this league, just based on where he's playing. He's one of the best centers in the league, one of the most unappreciated players in the league. But it, you have to wonder: Did did San Jose? bail on Nabokov too early. Apparently, he still has them. His goals against isn't tremendous, but it's keeping the Islanders afloat. Mm-hmm. And you have, I don't want to say no names, because they're not no names. I mean, we've seen Grabner play in the past. He's, yeah. been, he's been emerging as a, as a decent goal-scoring threat. You have Tavares down there. You have... Brad Boys, Mark Strait. Brad Boys, <laughs> Strait is playing, Strait is playing fairly well for for someone of his caliber he's he's a little bit a little bit older but you know what he's he's still holding his own um 
I don't know the relation of the other Strite. Are they brothers? No, cousins? definitely different spelling of the name. Okay. Um, <laughs> it just sounds confusing for broadcasters, that's all. But they they brought in um, Nisnovsky, and, he, and he's been playing well for him on the point. Mm-hmm. Matt Martin is a, is, a, is a favorite player of mine, a guy who can score and, and, and punch you in the face <laughs> five minutes later. <laughs> it's good to see. We, we know the... the the New York, New York Islanders as a Saturday afternoon matinee. Oh yeah, they always play in the seven, afternoon. Seven thousand people in the <laughs> arena for a an all out brawl oh, between just, yeah. them and Ottawa or them and Buffalo, and in, in that sense, they've come a long way to where they're not they're, they're not seen as just some goon team to mm-hmm. to pad your your penalty minute stats against. Well, do you think them moving to the Barclays Center in a couple of years, do you think that that's going to get them more fans showing up to the games and, you know, more support just in general? I, I think so. I, I think a lot has to do with, it, it sounds weird, but the, the troubles that that, that that team has had in the past financially and managerial-wise is, is horrendous coming out of the 80s where they were they were a dynasty yeah and and struggling with life for 20 years with just poor management and not enough support from fans not enough support from taxpayers i don't know if you've been up to long island lately oh, yeah. but that that stadium um no, it's falling apart is isn't isn't really no it's not horrible to hockey anymore <laughs> Yeah. But you put him in Brooklyn, yeah, I, I don't think you'll have a tremendous amount of fan base follow them to Brooklyn. Yeah. But you have more availability for for money-making options. And honestly, it's it's a fresh start. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we, we, we saw them as a dynasty in the 80s, but a long time ago. And and you want to start winning, you want to start making money, you want to make a name for yourself. Yeah. It may be time for a, a bit of a facelift. Well, we know that when fans show up to the games, the beer sales are incredibly high. And if you have a call go against the Islanders, you'll see beer bottles pour onto the ice circa ni- or 2007 against the Buffalo Sabres. So it's always got to, all roads lead to Buffalo somehow, and all of our topics do. And uh, we do apologize to anyone that's offended by that. I don't apologize. (laughs) Well, maybe you should. The hockey gods have kept Buffalo out of the playoffs or kept them from going far for a number of years now. Let's let's, let's Let's close out. Yeah, so the playoffs. Yeah, so so you think Buffalo does not make it, Winnipeg does make it. Who drops from the top eight in order to accommodate? for Winnipeg to make the playoffs? Ottawa. You say Ottawa does. Okay. I, I still don't I don't I still don't buy into Ottawa. Well, they beat Washington tonight, so that puts them up a little bit out of reach for Winnipeg. So they got Toronto, Pittsburgh, Washington again, Philadelphia and Boston. They have pretty much the longest schedule left. Uh more games left than most, so we'll have to wait and see. Yeah. All right. I want to I, I want I want to throw this at you and, and see where your head's at. What you got? Talk, talk to me, and we'll finish out with this today. Um, talk to me about these outdoor games. We're not going to call them winter classics because no. you can only have one winter classic. Exactly. Um, but these outdoor games that the NHL are going with, where's your head at with these? Mm, you know, I've had, when I, when I had the, uh, the podcast with the Hockey Rant and when I had my TV show up in Erie, Pennsylvania, this topic has come up numerous times you want to know why it's because all right they decided hey let's have this once a year that's great okay let's keep going with this fans love it they eat it up let's have it at baseball stadiums football stadiums uh let's do it let's let's have fun with this well the nhl you know obviously canceled uh, this past year's winter classic with detroit and toronto and they're going to bring it back to the big house they announced on january 1st 2014 But that also came with another announcement just on its coattails, and that was that there was going to be a total of six outdoor games. I'm, no, 
I am not I am not a fan of this at all. Yeah, it sounds cool that you're going to put the Kings outdoors with the Ducks at Dodger Stadium. That sounds great, but you know what? Make it special. Make it the outdoor game of the season. And I do understand that when they added the Heritage Classic, I'm like, okay, all right. You got the New Year's Eve or the New Year's Day game that is in the national spotlight competing with bowl games. That's all well and good. I am okay with that. That's great. But, you know, you throw in the Heritage Classic about a month, month and a half later. That's cool. It's a tribute to Canada being the founders of the sport here in North America. That's great. But then when you say, hey, let's put two games at Yankee Stadium in the same week. And, oh, by the way, that's the same week the Super Bowl is. And the Super Bowl is just across the river in New Jersey. And, um, okay, so let's have the Devils and the Rangers and the Rangers and the Islanders. Okay, so what is, it, what is our tally up to now? Uh, the Rangers will have participated in four outdoor games at that point, which I think is a little bit of overkill on the Rangers. Give some other teams a chance. Why hasn't the Minnesota Wild had an outdoor game? Okay, and then, oh, by the way, a month and a half later, actually almost, yeah, about a month uh because it's the end of January, so yeah, let's go with a March 1st game at Soldier Field, Blackhawks-Penguins. Okay, yes, we've seen that matchup before, oh, way back when, in the 90s, and now we're going to bring it to Soldier Field. Uh, well, Chicago already hosted one, so this is going for two, and then, oh, the next day we're going to have Canucks and Senators. Okay, I understand that's the Heritage Classic. Leave that one there. Take the rest of them out, okay? This is is overkill, and if this is the league's response to the NHL lockout this year, it's pathetic. They need to do a little bit more than this, and not this, actually. Just keep they, it the way you had it. They came out of the last lockout, and, and granted, I, I think we've all warmed up in some way, shape, or form to the, the shootout. shootout. Yeah. Um, that's, that's fine. It, it took a while. But I think we're all on board with it. It's a part of the game now, and, and it makes things interesting. It, it, it requires a certain skill and a certain um, type of player to go out and get you that extra point night in and night out. I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on board with you here and say that, that it's, it's a little bit too much. The idea of an outdoor game from, what was it, way back in 2003, Yep. Yeah, it was 2003. The, You're right. The, the first Heritage Classic. Yep. A lot of fun to watch, and and you know, the, the idea of playing outdoors was was always something that you toyed with in your head, and they made it happen. Yeah. Well, and then they 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 let it be for a couple of years. Yeah. And then 2008, they they put it back in Buffalo, and it, it was just it, it was a success. And I think each year it has had successes. But you're going to lose that luster of the outdoor game. Yeah, it, it's not going to be. Oh, this this is the one and only time I get to see this this season. I will tune in and enjoy it. Yeah. Rather, it's going to be. No, I don't really care for these teams. I'm not really a uh, a, a Kings and Ducks fan. I. I I'm, I'm not going to watch an outdoor game in a non-hockey market. Yeah. What, what do I care about these teams? Well, you, you do know that the first NHL outdoor game was held in 92 at Caesars Palace, right? Ooh, refresh my memory. L.A. Kings, New York Rangers exhibition game, and they built a rink out in the parking lot, and they played a, an, a full game out there, and if my mind serves me correctly, the Kings won that game. Yeah, they actually had the first outdoor game at the professional level out in Las Vegas. So why did it take them 11 years to bring it back and then delay it for four years after or five years after that? It it, it bothers me that now all of a sudden they're like, well, we know we have the technology to make it happen in any market. I mean, granted, 1992 in Las Vegas. Uh, that's astounding. But... Now they're like, let's push the limits here. No, I want to see. I, it was unique when you brought it on back in 08. It was perfect in 08 because it snowed out and uh, the poster child of the league gets the game winner in a shootout. And it, it had all the elements that you needed. Pittsburgh, remember, it rained. You're going to run into a lot more problems. Yep. 
I think, if if you're you're trying to have an outdoor game in March in in California, it it's it seems like a recipe for disaster. Well, that one is in January. That the the one uh, in L.A. is January twenty fifth. Oh, excuse me, excuse yeah. me. Uh, not nonetheless, though, March first. In Field. Chicago, yeah. March second in Vancouver. It's weather's starting to change, and I don't know if if you have all these malfunctions and and you embarrass yourself, you embarrass the league on national television. Yeah. In 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 a market that's already the let's say the laughing stock because <laughs> it, it's 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 come a long way since the Outdoor Life Network. No, five, yeah. six years ago, um, but but certainly they're not winning any 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 hearts for nationally televised games. Well, they already broke on, ES, on ESPN yeah. or or ABC like they used to or on Fox. Mm -hmm. If you don't have the NBC Sports Network, you see one or two games a week. Yeah, uh, they've already broken our hearts. Okay, we had this lockout abbreviate our season, and now we're going through the torment of. What this season tells us for next season, you're not gonna you're not gonna be able to tell much. I'll tell you that right now. Maybe Montreal maintains its you know its strength into next season. I you know we don't know. We can't tell a whole lot when you gauge this season up against the next season compared to the previous season. And then when you compare Winter, winter Classics too, uh, it, it, this is all connected in a way. You you look at the way it was conducted in 2008. It was great. 2009. Fantastic! It was Detroit, Chicago, and that was awesome. That was fun to watch because they had rooftops uh, next to uh, the field, uh, the Wrigley Field. I mean, it was fantastic to see this. It was fantastic to see the, the atmosphere and this rivalry of Chicago and Detroit, which is going to take a hit because of this realignment, which we'll talk about in another podcast. But then the next year, you know, they, was it the next year? It was Boston and Philadelphia. I mean, I almost forgot about that one. Yeah, and then uh, all of a sudden, it, Pittsburgh and Washington. The only reason why I remember that one is because, first off, I'm living in Washington, and I hear about it all the time. And all my friends are from Pittsburgh, and they're still living it up in the 2008 uh, Winter Classic. It rained, and they had to delay it. They had to push back. They they put the game at what eight o'clock at night instead. I, I I can't remember when it exactly it started, but they had a rain delay. Take take this take this approach to it. Um, if if you're out in California, and it's it's kings and ducks, uh -huh. and you're 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 out you're outside, and it begins to rain, and the conditions aren't conducive for a hockey game, yet they still play it, and you half-ass the event, and it costs a team two points, they end up missing the playoffs by two points. Yeah, you could certainly revert back to that game and say. It wasn't a fair contest. Look at what we had to play in. Right. Nobody else in the league had to play in those conditions. Why do we get penalized for something like this? Well, <laughs> it might be all in the whole teams are fighting to be in the Winter Classic or an outdoor game. Everybody wants to be a part of it, but th that's just a problem. Teams don't want to be a part of an outdoor game that's been just overblown to the point where there's six sure. in one season. They want to be in the premier outdoor game. I'm surprised that teams are on board with this. It really shocks me that they're doing this. I don't know if this is something that was pushed down by the league to these teams saying, you're going to participate in this outdoor game, and your city's going to host it, and yada, 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 yada. I mean, it's like I want to know what the discussion was that led to deciding that six games was a good idea in one season. My, my, my solution, if you will, and, I, and I've been toying around with this idea for a couple of years, if you want to do something unique, take a hockey game, take a hockey team to a market where there is no hockey. Mm -hmm. Play a game there. The fans will come. They will. If, if, the, if you have a, an event that is so unique, let's, oh, yeah. say, let's say South Carolina, you put a Canes game, Canes, uh, let's call it, I'd, I'd say Atlanta, Okay. Um, let's go, let's call it Kentucky. Okay. Put Columbus, uh, put Nashville mm -hmm. against each other in a game in Kentucky. 
find a market that does not sell itself to hockey fans. You put it between the two, the fans will come. Kansas will City, drive. Dallas, and Minnesota. Perfect. See? That's Perfect. it. Arrowhead Stadium, it'll be Dallas and Minnesota. Perfect. I hope the league is listening. <laughs> now, now you're now you're exploiting not exploiting now you're introducing hockey to markets that don't necessarily consider hockey a sport. Well, Kansas City is fighting hard to get a team to occupy oh, sure Sprint are. Center, and and in the Jim Ball silly drama, he thought he could you know get away with it. Oh yeah, maybe I can move a team to Kansas City. No, I'm 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 moving a team to Hamilton. But um, yeah, I I like your idea. I I really do. And, 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 and you, you yeah. have the, the whole idea of, yeah, the Ducks and the Kings, they are West Coast rivals. If if you're not a hockey fan, a true hockey fan, you don't know that. Yeah. It, would, it's, yeah. It's, it's not a hockey market. I would have picked San Jose. The, yeah. But you know, introduce the game to, to people who are not familiar with it. Show them how fans get excited. And, and maybe you'll begin to expand your your viewing area. Yeah. And d don't don't give me six outdoor games. Give me two outdoor games in a city that's never seen a professional hockey game before. Yeah. I mean, heck, I I even thought San Jose and Phoenix would have been a great contest. Put that one in either San Jose. I wouldn't put it in Phoenix because the San Jose fan base they're they're pretty solid, and I yeah. like them. And they they've they've got some good representation, and they Play pack the house. Play a game down in San Diego. There you go. So, Exploit those big cities with not much <laughs> going for them. The Padres really aren't bringing them in lately, so. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. So, your final thoughts on the outdoor games? I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna side with you on this one. I'm thinking it's a little bit overkill, and I don't think Batman pulled the right tricks out of the bag for this one. I think he's gonna find that after the first one. They're going to flop. The Heritage Classic won't flop because it won't. But the other ones, people people aren't going to reserve time in their schedule to watch an outdoor game yeah. when there already have been four played. For the record, the Yankee Stadium games are as follows here. It's January 26th against the Devils. That's a Sunday. And then Wednesday, the 29th. Against the Shut Islanders. Up. Yes, so they're going to do a middle of the week outdoor game. And then the March 1st game is on a weekend, and that's logical. It's on a Saturday. And then the March 2nd game, of course, the day after is a Sunday. But yeah, that's where I'm completely confused. I don't know what you're, the league you're is. You're playing thinking. an outdoor game on a Wednesday? Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and take off from work and go right down to Yankee Stadium. Granted, granted, you're in. A heavily populated area, and granted, it is a subway series. Mm -hmm. But how many people can you get to commit to Yankee Stadium in January in <laughs> New York? <laughs> yeah, on a Wednesday. Well, we'll find out when they open the tickets uh, sales, and uh, we'll see because it'll probably sell. It'll probably oh, sell. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Before you go to ticket sales, how many of those tickets are being purchased in order to resell at an ungodly amount of money? Yeah, true, true. Now, people will do that, yep, yep, because they're, they're vultures out there, and they'll do anything to make a buck nowadays. And true. I'm I'm disappointed the league decided to go in this direction, and now it, 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 does, it does lead them away from the possibility of drawing in new fans because that was what – the luster was behind the Winter Classic. It was bringing in new fans to see this sport in a unique environment back to its roots. And, you know, it, it's, it, it was what drew people in. Now it's going to be like, I'm going to be flipping through the channels on January 29th on a Wednesday. Hey, granted, Buffalo might be playing, but yeah, I might uh, channel surf and then, oh, yeah, okay. And then just move on. Yep. I mean, are you going to have Jim Hewson and Doc Emmerich and everybody flock out to these sites? I mean, seriously, I, I, if you're not going to if you're not going to treat these games like they are the Winter Classic and give them the big pomp and circumstance and build this up as some big event for each of these, it's going to be a waste of time. It really is. It's true. Yep. So. I'm on board with you. Yeah. All right. Well, let's close it out here uh, next week. 
well, we're obviously going to have a lot to talk about next week. Uh, first off, uh, your birthday's coming up, so we'll be talking about that. And the closeout. Right. And uh, yes, yes, yeah, you, you're turning a big round number, aren't you? No. <laughs> Heavens no, I got one more year for that. Ah, uh, yeah, so do I. So we, we'll reveal that one day, uh, what that round number will be. So uh, next week, the season will conclude at the end of next week. Or actually, I beg your pardon, it'll be April 28th, but we'll have plenty to talk about next week. I uh, will probably do something at the end of the week here to catch up on the race towards the finish. So we'll cut it off here. This is David Stearns for Brian Schrems saying take care, everybody, and as always, don't stop believing.